In the world of One Piece, will is power. Stake your life on it, Shanks says to the bandit right before his quick demise. These men weren't fighting for anything. What they wanted was simply right in front of them. Just because something is tangible in the moment, that doesn't mean it's superior to the seemingly intangible dreams that those few brave enough aspire to reach. As a matter of fact, those fantastical dreams, at least in One Piece, are shown to be superior. Superior in that they lead the ones who are strong enough to take the treacherous path that inevitably comes from following that set dream to victory. Which is why Shanks himself didn't have to even lift a finger. The bandits weren't after something bigger than themselves. They do not dare to go out to sea where real villains lurk. Shanks didn't even flinch when his comrade shot and killed someone. He is a pirate after all. The biggest difference between Shanks' crew and the mountain bandits is not how much better they are morally, but their superior wills. On Jaya, when Luffy parallels the actions Shanks once had, Blackbeard takes notice of Luffy's strength, because he too is someone brave enough to dream. And like Luffy and so many others, he takes it a step further and puts himself in harm's way in order to reach that dream. But Blackbeard is also a menace. Ace fights him because he killed Thatch, a member of the crew, someone who is supposed to be family. Ace is a lot like Luffy. He's been hunting down Blackbeard all this time, after all, because he killed a Nakama. And Ace confronts not just Blackbeard, but his entire crew in order to get revenge for himself and the Whitebeard pirates. Ace took it upon himself to do this. He didn't have to but he felt he had to. He seemingly has the upper hand because along with this, Ace being Luffy's older brother, we assume has a willpower on par with Luffy's. And he does. We see his metal to endure an impel down, and we see him use Conqueror's Hockey as a child, the literal manifestation of his conquering will. But Blackbeard's is just as strong, evident in the fact that he continues to progress in his own way, becoming a warlord, using that status to break into Impel Down and gather strong members for his crew, and even coming face to face with Whitebeard in order to obtain a new power for himself. So what happens when two wills are evenly matched? Well, the rest obviously comes down to combat capability, something Ace failed to recognize Blackbeard had over him. And for that, he is defeated. In Alabasta, Luffy faced a similar problem. Before Luffy and Crocodile's first showdown, Luffy had only faced people below him in terms of combat prowess and resolve. Don Krieg was a pirate who failed to make it in the Grand Line. He relied solely on weaponry and armor to hide how weak of a man he actually was. Arlong was content with forcing the weak to do his bidding, because he too could not match up to the ones with true strength. But here, Luffy isn't fighting someone who is scared to take the steps to achieve his goals. Not only that, but Crocodile is someone who knows humility something he learned from being on the Grand Line for so long, and from his defeat to Whitebeard. It helped him grow, to become stronger, and this shows in his mastery of his devil fruit. The difference between these two is experience, the experience of failure, because the only way one can truly grow is through failure, and not too long after this, Luffy would experience a mountain of failure, and this would be his first, at the hands of a true pirate. Luffy became stagnant from all of the victories that didn't call for too much of his effort. This stagnation, completely paralleled by Zoro. Zoro's fight with Mihawk wasn't just one-sided because of the enormous skill gap, but because of resolve as well. Mihawk asks Zoro, What do you bear on your shoulders? What do you desire once you've obtained power? And Zoro doesn't have an answer. His ambition means a little more than just the world's strongest, sure, evident in the fact that he's pursuing this hard for Kawina's sake as well, but that only means his goal is not his alone. Luffy wants to be Pirate King, but not just to relish in the title's glory. As a matter of fact, that's just an afterthought. He just wants to be free to do whatever he wants, and the Pirate King is the only title with enough power to make that impossibility seem possible. Zoro wants to be the strongest simply because he wants the honor of the title, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in the world of One Piece, where conviction means strength, that alone can only ever get Zoro so far. And this becomes clear again with Mr. One, an opponent who cuts everything without a second thought, only knowing how to destroy. Because why would he have to worry about what's in front of him when he cares about little to nothing other than killing? He's a true, cold-hearted assassin. Zoro is not like Mr. One, even before his transcendence, he took so many blows yet still keeps standing. Unlike Mr. One who goes down after Zoro's one successful attack. There's no comparison in this battle of wills. But before he learns how to cut steel, he's still missing something important. For what purpose is he doing this? Why does this battle matter now? He could continue being like Mr. One and only focus on his personal growth and power, or he could look at the surroundings for a moment. His comrades were stuck in their own heated conflicts. What if they needed him? 
What if they died while he was too busy stuck with his own fight? Some of them are quite a bit weaker than him after all, and he indeed looks and listens, and then learns how to cut nothing. How to protect. Zoro didn't transcend Mr. One. He transcends himself. And Luffy does something similar with Crocodile. He learns and adapts. But this still isn't enough. Luffy would have to use everything. For like Katakuri so much later on, Crocodile is Luffy's clear better. And finally, in the third showdown, right after coming out of the brink of death, Luffy comes back and risks it all again. Exhausted, bloodied, poisoned. But because of this tenacity, because of this unyielding will, Luffy is rewarded with victory. And with this, he learned what a real battle between pirates is like. But what about the Marines? What about the Admirals? The individuals with strength so far beyond Luffy's. Aokiji, who so easily dismantled all of the monster trio in one attack. Yet still, Luffy fights. Even with this massive display of power, he doesn't waver. And why should he? Up till now, he successfully defeated foes through will and tenacity alone, with of course the occasional miracle. But this isn't like any fight before. His enemy doesn't underestimate him, for he knows Luffy's status and what he's capable of. What the fight with Aokiji blatantly displays is that even in One Piece, will alone cannot lead one to triumph. There must always be some level of skill involved, and Luffy, so far away from the level of Admiral in that regard, is quickly and easily defeated. I think it's a mistake to say that the reason Luffy survives this encounter is because he was rewarded for at least trying to stand up to overwhelming opposition. The reality is, he was just lucky. Lucky that Aokiji owes his grandfather. When Rayleigh trains Luffy and asks what he would do when faced with an opponent that was stronger than him, Luffy responds that it would depend on the enemy's personality. And he's right. Here, Aokiji spares Luffy on a whim. Nothing more. Even if Luffy allowed his comrades to escape, what would they do without him if he died here? The tunnel vision mindset of sprinting through everything without a second thought wouldn't work anymore. Even Luffy learned that from this. In the encounter with CP9 to follow, he would have to grow. In skill this time. And he does. The gears mark a turning point in Luffy's development. No longer would he rely solely on his willpower to get through tough situations. The places he is heading towards are full of monsters who share in his absurd amount of spirit, evident in the fact that in the New World, we have seen many people utilize Conqueror's hockey, and those very same people forging their own path. But sometimes, with great power comes great risk. Luffy didn't train to comfortably use this power after all. In this short time span, Luffy used pure ingenuity to come up with a way to forcibly make himself stronger. And it worked. But this comes with great sacrifice. After he uses Gear 3rd, he becomes tiny and useless. And even worse with Gear 2nd, the form withers at his very lifespan. Luffy is literally sacrificing himself each time he fights in order to protect the ones weaker than him. But this will only ever go so far. There's a limit to how much a body can take. A strong will won't give back years taken away. It still isn't enough. Against Magellan, Luffy has to risk poisoning himself just to get a couple of hits in. He keeps standing when he should have long since fallen, but he doesn't. He did everything he could. All for nothing. He never could reach Ace. He survives due to yet another miracle, but how long can he keep this up? His life is chipping away and yet he isn't getting any closer to what he wants. Even when it seems like he does, he really doesn't. Ace dies protecting him. Protecting him because Luffy's body finally gave out. Overuse of gear second, hormone injections, whatever it took. To Luffy, what's his life worth if he can't protect anyone? But that's the irony. In the end, he became the one needed saving, because he isn't strong enough. And for the first time in the story, we see Luffy's will break down. It's interesting to note the dichotomy of Whitebeard and Luffy during this arc. Luffy, a pirate so far below Whitebeard in terms of status and strength, yet he still keeps going even after so much strain on his body. Whitebeard is the same in this regard, yet different in his ability to keep going. Whitebeard was old and sick, yet through willpower alone he kept fighting on. Even after taking more damage than anyone at Marineford, where Luffy's will collapsed after witnessing a close one die, Whitebeard continued forward in order to set the stage for the new generation. Even with his dying breath, just like Roger, he used the last ounce of his life to make a difference, and his lifeless body still stands, the representation of his undying will. Because his will will surely be inherited by Marco, Jozu, Vista, or even Luffy. At the very end of the first half of the story, we see the full extent of what a strong will can accomplish, and it becomes clear that even in that department, Luffy is lacking. 
But after training, after spending some time in the new world, is Luffy ready? We've seen the peak of willpower demonstrated by a Yonko, so it's only safe to assume the ones who share in that title are comparable in spirit. In the Whole Cake Island arc, Luffy and half the crew have to fight just to barely survive in Emperor Big Mom's territory. And it's here that I believe Oda best utilizes the concept of wills in his fighting mechanics. Sweet Commander Charlotte Katakuri vs Monkey D. Luffy is a fight that's earned its fair share of praise. But it's also garnered a large amount of criticism. How in blazes did Luffy win if Katakuri is his better in every department? I'll tell you how because Katakuri isn't. Sure, he seemingly is at first, but this is later to be revealed as only a facade. In the beginning of the match, Luffy is clearly out of his league. Devil Fruit Mastery, Armament Hockey, and Observation Hockey. All of this Katakuri has over him. It's a mismatch. Anything Luffy can do, Katakuri can do better. But there's two things that keep Luffy standing regardless of this. His durability earned from the countless beatings he has taken from his many hard-fought battles, and most importantly, his will. Luffy could have ran back to his crew after capturing Brulee, but he didn't. He willingly chose to go back to the mirror world to continue his fight with Katakuri, because he wants to grow. His tenacity is something almost overwhelming for even Katakuri, which is why, to defeat Luffy, he would have to go all out, because if he doesn't, Luffy would just stand back up. But Katakuri doesn't go all out, or more precisely, at first, he can't. When Luffy is seemingly defeated, Katakuri retreats to privacy, the only time when he can act himself, and his true self is nothing like the outward image he lets be exposed. Not diligent, not cool, not perfect. He's even laying on his back, gaping mouth exposed. This is Charlotte Katakuri, the real Katakuri. When he puts back on the scarf and continues his fight with Luffy, he wavers. He isn't as strong. A chink in his seemingly unbreakable armor finally shows. His will falters. Like Luffy's straw hat, Katakuri's scarf is not just a scarf, but a symbol of his conviction, a conviction of lies. Katakuri resolved himself to create the image of a perfect and unstoppable older brother, because that's what he believed he needed to be. In order to protect his younger siblings, he shouldered the responsibility of the Big Mom pirates. Yes, shouldering even Big Mom's burdens. Big Mom, after all, is essentially an oversized child, who happens to be one of the most powerful characters in the world. At least in Katakuri's mind, someone had to do it. And this gives the Big Mom pirate strength, but only in reputation. And as becomes clear later on directly after this arc's conclusion, reputation is not necessarily synonymous with reality. Katakuri's reality is that like everyone else, he is a flawed individual. But he can't let that show out of fear that if he does, it might even risk the collapse of the Big Mom pirates. A leap in logic, sure, but to Katakuri, it's a real risk. If the Big Mom Pirates collapse, then that means his siblings are put in harm's way. Something more than anything, he cannot bear. Just like Luffy. These two fighters are different in their circumstances, but basically the same in what they want. At the end of the day, they just want to be able to protect the ones closest to them. It's only that Luffy trusts in his comrades enough not to shoulder everything alone, whereas Katakuri deluded himself into believing that was his only option. So understandably, when even a semblance of that perfection was tarnished, Katakuri began losing ground, something he later reclaimed because the only witnesses were now dead and in Katakuri's perspective, Luffy would soon be as well. But this wouldn't last long. Katakuri finally deals a devastating wound, but it wasn't his work alone that made this possible. Luffy was distracted by Flampe's needle, and this should be fine for Katakuri. He was having trouble after all. His perfect image for a little while was being broken. If Luffy dies here, Katakuri can go back to being every little brother and sister's role model. But like Luffy once had when he came back to the mirror world, Katakuri defies logic and does the unthinkable. Luffy wouldn't have blamed Katakuri for just continuing the fight as is. Just like Katakuri wouldn't have blamed Luffy for running away when he had the chance. But both fighters, even now Katakuri, want to grow. He discards the scarf, the representation of his conviction, and lets the world see his imperfect face. Luffy had made an impact on him. From seeing Luffy get knocked down time after time, yet still refuse to stay down. Something that should be humiliating. Yet to Luffy, it's what it means to be strong. To him, it's what it means to be a pirate. And through this exposure, where a sibling that he wanted to protect was mocking that very conviction that makes Luffy so strong, Katakuri finally rejects his false path as a pirate, and lets himself be free of an impossible burden, so that like Luffy, he too can grow. 
and this marks the climax of the greatest battle of wills we have seen thus far in the story. Katakuri willingly stabs and effectively nerfs himself by discarding Mole. Also, he can be on even ground with Luffy. None of it making any logical sense, but all of it a sign of respect for the opponent Katakuri has come to appreciate. And so, the fight continues. But where Luffy was willing to keep going, Katakuri's will gives out. Because unlike Luffy, this was his first battle fighting this way. An ugly fight with nothing held back. It is all Luffy knows how to do, whereas Katakuri had only just now started. He falls on his back, putting the final nail in the coffin to the old him. But this is only the beginning for his new journey. As I said before, one can only truly grow when first experiencing failure. Luffy wins the battle of wills. Sure, he is lucky that Katakuri responded in this manner, but as One Piece likes to remind us time and time again, physical strength and skill aren't everything, nor are they the most important.